Hilltop Securities is leading the herd in municipal finance, building on a 75-year legacy of public service and trusted personal relationships. Through decades-long partnerships with local government, state agencies, and nonprofits, we've made a lasting impact on our communities. We've helped state HFAs make housing more affordable by providing mortgage hedging and pipeline management. And we've helped generations of individual and institutional investors reach their financial goals. That tradition continues as we find new ways to support our clients' changing needs. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Furs, and I am the director of the State Energy Office here in Washington State. I use he, him pronouns, and I work for the Washington State Department of Commerce. Uh, I'm really excited to hear the conversation today uh, because electrification and electrification of buildings is a core part of the work that we do here in Washington State to bring about a more clean, affordable, and just energy future for the state, uh, with a particular focus on uh, folks that are most vulnerable. But I also am excited to be among housing people. Uh, in my life before energy, uh, I worked for the New Mexico Housing Finance Commission and taught a course in affordable housing uh, at the University of New Mexico. And, um, and just making sure that folks have a secure place to live is uh, a part of what brings me to work every day. I just focus on a slightly different version. So I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Leah Stokes. She is the Anton Vonk Associate Professor of Environmental Politics in the Department of Political Science and is also affiliated with the Brand School of Environmental Science and Management in the Environmental Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Dr. Stokes focuses her work on energy, climate, and environmental politics. In 2022, she was named an advocate on Time 100 Next, and as one of Business Insider's top 30 global leaders working toward climate solutions. Her book, Short Circuiting Policy, which you can see over her right shoulder, examines the role that utilities have played in promoting climate denial and rolling back clean energy laws. She's also contributed to the anthology, All We Can Save, which is a New York Times bestselling collection of essays written by influential women in the climate space. As a leader on climate change, she speaks all over the country. Uh, and today we really are honored to have Dr. Stokes here with us to share her thoughts on how the future is electric. Let's welcome Dr. Leah Stokes. Well, thank you so much, Michael. It was wonderful to have the opportunity to meet you a little bit before the talk. And I feel that it's really lucky that Washington State has you at the helm of the State Energy Office. Um, so let me just share my slides here. So I'm gonna to talk today about electrification. And this may be a topic that you are very deep in the weeds on, or maybe a topic that you're new to. And I'm hopeful that I'll be able to sort of hit some interesting points regardless of how uh, well-versed you are in this topic. Um, and as Michael mentioned, I am a professor at UC Santa Barbara and I'm also affiliated with the nonprofit Rewiring America. And I mention that because Rewiring America is working um, with groups all over the country to try to advance electrification. We're really the leading electrification nonprofit. And so if after this talk, there's specific things you'd like to connect on with the team, I'm sure there's great people who can help support some of your work. So, you know, so many of us, even in our personal lives, ask ourselves this question, or maybe people ask us this question if we work on climate change. I certainly get asked this maybe more than anything else, which is what can I do about climate change? And the typical answer that we see in the media, even in some environmental groups, um, are, and, and of course from fossil fuel companies too, are things like this, the carbon footprint. We should plant trees, stop using plastic, ride our bikes, eat less meat, reuse water. And I don't wanna say that these aren't important things to do. I do many of them myself, but it really um, doesn't get at the heart of the problem, which is that climate change is caused by burning fossil fuels. And so I want to give you a different framework to think about what is climate change as a problem and therefore what is the solution, whether in your personal life or of course in your work, particularly around housing and affordable housing. So this is a picture of where 
greenhouse gas pollution comes from across the economy nationwide in the United States. And you may have heard, you know, that there's carbon dioxide, but that there's also other things like methane. That's another word for fossil gas or natural gas, right? CH4. Um, there's nitrous oxide. And there's also these super pollutants called HFCs and other kinds of chemicals that basically have a really intense warming potential. So you're like, wow, okay, there's carbon dioxide, but then there's also these other things and, you know, they have different global warming potentials and it's very confusing. So it's a complex problem just in terms of the pollutants. And it's also a complex problem in terms of the sectors that pollution comes from. This is slightly different than Washington State, and I'll show you um, some data about how Washington State looks like later on. But for nationwide, the way to think about it is that about a little more than a quarter of carbon pollution nationwide comes from transportation. It's even higher in Washington State. Another quarter comes from electric power. It's lower in your backyard. And then another quarter comes from heavy industry. And then we have agriculture and really buildings in that residential and commercial uh, chunks together. So this is a complex problem that cuts across huge swaths of our society. It involves lots of different pollutants. How can we think about wrapping our heads around this? Well, what I want you to realize is that it's a little bit more simple than this. Let's just take that pie chart and simplify it, right? We've got electric power, we've got transportation, we've got buildings heavy industry, and agriculture. How are we going to solve this problem? Well, I'm going to tell you that there's really two things you have to think about. Clean electricity and electrification. So the first thing we're going to do, and it's something where Washington State is really ahead of the curve nationally, is clean up our electricity system and get to 100% clean electricity whether that's nationwide by 2035, according to President Biden's goals, or by 2030, net zero in Washington state, according to um, state law, and that will cut 25% of our carbon pollution, our greenhouse gas pollution nationwide. The next thing we wanna do is electrify as much of the transportation sector as possible. And it turns out we can actually electrify a lot. You know, sometimes people get hung up on things like airplanes or heavy duty vehicles and they think, wow, it's so hard to do. But think more about bicycles or motorcycles or, of course, cars or school buses, right, or light duty trucks even. Those are all technologies that we can put a battery in, that we can drive around and we can power those electrons. We can power those machines with that clean electricity, right? We can do the same thing for our buildings. So right now, a lot of our buildings across the country use fossil gas or natural gas for heating in particular. Some of them use propane or oil as well. That's even the case in some parts of Washington state. But we don't have to do that. We could actually use things like heat pumps, heat pump hot water heaters, induction stoves to electrify our buildings. And that's what I'm going to particularly focus on today. And then people tend to think that these other chunks of the problem, industry and agriculture, are hard to decarbonize sectors. And that is true, except that about half of heavy industry, what we would think about our industrial sector, can actually be electrified. These are things like beverage manufacturing, food manufacturing, things that we do that don't involve very high heat temperatures that might require different kinds of ways to decarbonize, things like, for example, hydrogen. So we can actually electrify a big part of our industrial sector too. And so what you can see here is that the math is pretty simple. If we can get to clean electricity, 100% clean power as fast as possible, and we can combine that by electrifying our transportation, our building, parts of heavy industry, we can actually solve about three quarters of the climate problem nationwide. So Although climate change is very complicated, it doesn't just involve, you know, riding your bike more or eating less meat or not using plastic bags. What it really involves is stopping fossil fuel use. And the way that we're going to do that is through clean electricity and electrification. So another way to think about this is everywhere in our society, everywhere in our state or in our communities or at the national level, that we are burning something right? That blue flame, for example, that you see in your kitchen or the furnace in your basement or, you know, uh, your car in your driveway. Every time we burn something, burn a fossil fuel, we have to replace that with electricity. 
with things like batteries, with wind and solar, et cetera. So it's a pretty simple framework. It's a lot easier to understand, in fact, than a lot of the ways that climate change is presented as a problem and its solution. And it turns out this is the way that we're probably going to address the lion's share of the climate problem. So I've told you that there's two things we need to understand, right? Clean electricity and electrification. So let's start by talking about clean electricity. We need to get to 100% clean electricity ASAP. That's the deadline. I think that's in statute somewhere. No, it's not. <laughs> but that was what I would say. We need to get there as soon as possible. So what do I mean by clean electricity? Well, of course, there are things like solar energy and wind energy, particularly offshore wind being a really important thing that we need to develop because offshore wind um, blows more frequently. It blows more consistently. It has what we would call a higher capacity factor. So it's a more stable resource that we can br bring into the electricity system. But then, of course, there are other forms of um, what we might think about as renewable electricity. Of course, hydroelectricity is massive in Washington state, um, you know, but there are other technologies that are not able to be used everywhere, just like you know, hydroelectricity can't be used everywhere, such as geothermal, wave energy, and tidal energy. The thing is that, and this probably won't be a surprise for people in Washington state, most of the hydroelectricity resources in this country have already been developed. So about 10% nationwide of our electricity comes from hydro of course, much higher in Washington state. And if we were to maximize every hydro resource that we could elsewhere in this country that hasn't been developed yet, we could maybe increase that to 15% of the current electricity mix in terms of the size of the system as it is right now. Well, that's not going to get us to 100%. So hydroelectricity is a really important resources. And for places that have it, it's fantastic. But it's unlikely to be something that grows a lot in the future. Geothermal is a great technology too, but again, it's not easy to do everywhere. And so, you know, that technology as a resource only makes up a small fraction of our electricity system and it hasn't really been growing. Wave energy and tidal energy are promising, but because they're often, you know, they're put in saltwater environments, they tend to corrode more frequently and they don't necessarily have as long lifespans. There may be some innovations done in those areas, but these technologies in the middle are unlikely to be growing at the pace that we really need. The places that we really see massive growth are particularly in solar energy, particularly combined with batteries, and to some extent in wind energy, particularly offshore. And then we have the other resources that are considered zero carbon resources, hypothetically. So we have nuclear energy, which of course, once it's built and it's operating, does not emit carbon pollution. We're not burning fossil fuels in the production of it. Um, nationwide, about 10%, uh, sorry, I misspoke, about 20% of our electricity comes from nuclear. Of course, people know that we're not building a lot of nuclear plants. There's like basically one uh, being built right now nationwide. They're quite expensive. They often go over budget and over schedule, which means that if we have a tight deadline to get to 100% clean power, it's unlikely that new nuclear sites are going to be a big part of that mix. They're quite expensive and they go over budget. But for existing nuclear sites, there's a really vibrant conversation going on about how can we keep safe nuclear plants open as long as possible? Because what we've been seeing when they get shut down in places like California and New York, for example, is that they get backfilled typically with fossil gas, with fossil fuels. And so they actually increase the, electric the, the carbon pollution from the electricity system when nuclear plants shut down. And then finally, there's hydro uh, hydrogen energy. This is a quite hot topic right now, the, uh, something I've actually been doing a bunch of work on because into the Inflation Reduction Act, the law passed last year, there's a tax credit for hydrogen. It's called 45V. If you're curious, it's quite a generous uh, subsidy. It works out to something like five cents a kilowatt hour compared to the nuclear energy subsidies, which are in a few cents, or the wind and solar subsidies, which are like two to three cents. So it's quite a big subsidy. And it's leading to very intense debates around how should we decide if something is truly green hydrogen or not. And I'm happy to talk about this more in the Q&A if people are interested, but the main principle is that, that myself and others in the environmental community are putting forward on having true hydrogen that is green is three principles. First, it needs to be uh, created from a new electricity resource. So you can't just pull, for example, a hydropower resource away from the grid and instead make hydrogen and call that clean because you're making the grid dirtier as you are making hypothetically clean hydrogen. It needs to be 
um, made in the same place where your clean electricity is. So, you know, you can't make a hydrogen, let's say in Ohio and buy renewable electricity certificates from Washington and somehow claim that your Ohio hydrogen, which is from an 80% fossil fuel electricity system is somehow clean. So it needs to be nearby, it needs to be deliverable. And third, it has to be happening at the same time. So, you know, if it's the middle of the night and the sun has gone down and there isn't, uh, you know, a bunch of renewables on the grid, you can't say that the hydrogen you made at three in the morning was made by solar energy. So these are really active debates that are going on right now. And ultimately, hydrogen could be built in a way that helps it really decarbonize our particularly heavy industry. But the um, jury is still out on that. It can also be used as a battery in the electricity system. So that is the picture of what we can do to clean up the electricity system from a technology side. Where are we at in terms of the pace that's necessary to actually hit these targets? Well, here's what the national electricity system looks like. We have about 60% of our energy system, electricity system nationwide that comes from dirty power, by which I mean fossil gas as well as coal. And there's 40%, as I mentioned, about 20% nuclear and about 20% uh, renewables and hydro. And the goal that President Biden has put forward is to get to 100% clean power by 2035. So that's going to be quite a challenge, uh, especially because nationwide we have 200 plus proposed gas plants, plants right now. The Washington state electricity picture looks a little bit different. You are all ahead of the curve, courtesy of living in a place with great hydropower resources. And I'm originally from Canada, so I know what it's like to come from a place with great hydropower like Ontario and Quebec, for example. It's wonderful that uh, Washington State is at the end of the curve, but at least when it comes to electricity, you all got a little bit of a leg up by being blessed with fabulous hydropower resources. So you can see here that right now, the electricity system in Washington State is pretty much one of the cleanest in the country, especially for a bigger state. You know, a place like Vermont is already uh, considered 100% clean, but they're not a very big state compared to Washington State. So there's still a chunk of the electricity mix, about 17%, let's say, in a given year that is coming from gas and a little bit from coal. There are, of course, um, laws now on the books in Washington state that Governor Inslee and others in the legislature championed to uh, try to fix this problem, interim targets to get rid of coal, as well as a goal to get to 100% greenhouse gas neutral by 2030, meaning that if there are still gas plants operating on the grid at that time, that there has to be some way to meaningfully offset that. And the thing is that we aren't really trying to just get to 100% electricity. Why do I say that? Because it turns out the electricity system at the size that it is today is used to power the you know, our homes and our buildings and our cars and everything else at the size that is today. But if we want to put electric vehicles on the grid, electric school buses, right, and scooters and cars, if we want to put buildings on the grid, whether those are really large scale uh, commercial buildings, affordable housing, uh, single family units, you know, all of that stuff going onto the electricity system, which is great news, is also going to be a challenge, right? Because we're going to need the electricity system, let's say, if it's this big to be like this big. So this is something that I have coined the Narwhal Curve. And if you're curious, you can look it up. It's a video on Grist and you're welcome to share it with others. It's like the three minute version of this talk uh, from a few years ago. Maybe I looked younger back then, but the basic principles still hold, which is that our electricity system is only, you know, about 40% clean or maybe in Washington state more like 80% plus clean, but we don't really just have to get to 100% clean because we need the size of the electricity system to be growing so that we can use the extra electricity to power our homes and our cars and parts of heavy industry. And I don't, I won't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this today, but I just wanted to also flag for folks this new idea that's really starting to take off, which is virtual power plants. So, you know, what we're starting to see with reports out of the Department of Energy, this is one they put out just a few weeks ago, or out of um, consulting groups like Brattle, is that the cheapest way to build new electricity resources in this country uh, are actually a combination of solar plus batteries plus 
what's called switch gear, basically the ability to island building or switch from solar to battery. And we're starting to see that this as a resource, as well as having the demand side, meaning the machines in the buildings, you know, the water heater, the furnace, having those be flexible, as we've already seen with products like Nest, for example, that allow people's thermostats to go up and down a bit when the grid needs uh, more electricity, for example, you know, that this paradigm of having a flexible demand side, having solar plus batteries and switch gear is really going to be huge. And the cool thing is that the Inflation Reduction Act has a number of tax credits that have been extended and even applied to things like batteries and switch gear for the first time. And so this is the kind of thing that we should be expecting to see more and more of as we go along. So that is the electricity side of the, the equation, what we might call the supply side or you know the electricity coming into the buildings. What do we have to do on the demand side, meaning the buildings, the cars, all those kinds of things in order to make progress? Well, it's fairly simple and also very complicated. We need to electrify everything that we can, okay? The, the, the shorter slogan without the caveat would just be electrify everything. So right now, if you think about your own home or affordable housing in your community, maybe things you're working on, specific projects, you probably notice that, the, that there are machines in these buildings that run on fossil fuels. These are things like stoves, right? that they burn gas, for example. They are things like the furnace, burning gas in some case, in some very limited cases in Washington state, um, burning um, propane, for example, or delivered fuels. And also the hot water tank, right? We have been using fossil fuels, natural gas as it's called, to do these services inside of buildings. But we don't have to anymore. We can now use things like induction stoves, which are basically a more efficient version of an electric stove that doesn't have any coils. It isn't like you're going back. It's actually quite a modern, exciting machine. I use them myself. Um, we also, of course, have heat pumps of many different varieties, many different sizes, everything from one that can sit in a window, for example, for renters, to you know a giant industrial uh, size machine that can cool down you know tens of thousands of square feet and also heat it up so heat pumps can both heat and cool buildings and they do it by moving um, energy around as by moving uh, heat around from outside to inside when the building needs to be warmer or cooling it down and because they're not burning things they are way more efficient because whenever you burn something right this is just thermodynamics you lose a lot of that energy because in the conversion process, about half of the energy is lost. So this is a way more efficient process. And we can also have heat pump hot water heaters uh, to do the same thing. I just wanna say one other thing. In Washington state, there's actually a fair amount of electric already, but this is called electric resistance. Electric resistance is a way of, for example, heating up a building with a radiator that doesn't uh, use the same efficiency of a heat pump. So it actually ends up using a lot more electricity than would be ideal. So not only do we wanna get rid of fossil fuels in our buildings, things like natural gas furnaces, we also wanna get rid of electric resistance heating systems because they are not as efficient. They use more kilowatt hours, more energy, and so they cost more money to operate. So those are both things that are on the table. And if we, for example, switch from electric resistance to heat pumps, sort of modern, efficient electric machines, that will also help with that narwhal curve, right? Because it means that the electricity system will not have to be as big because we'll be using less electricity to do the same thing, like, for example, heating our homes. You've probably seen the news this year. This has been kind of a really big topic in the media. But scientists at places like Stanford University um, and really all across this country for years have been studying the effects of, for example, burning gas in our homes. So cooking over a stove, for example. Um, and what they've been showing is that they put out levels of pollutants that are similar to like living with a smoker. So what do I mean by that? I mean, there are things like nitrous oxides, um, formaldehyde, which is a product of the combustion process. Uh, and it's a carcinogen, causes cancer. Also benzene, which is another carcinogen, which is um, in gas as a trace uh, sort of 
contaminant. And so you end up actually breathing in carcinogens, just like you would be doing if you were smoking cigarettes. So people are really starting to question if this whole cooking with gas idea is actually better, especially in terms of their health. So what does this picture look like nationwide? When I, see, when I say electrify everything we can, what do I mean? Well, right now in this country, there's a little bit less than 120 million space heaters that we need to convert into these heat pumps. There's 120 million cooking machines that are using fossil fuels like ovens or grills. There's about 20 million dryers. It's not super common to have um, gas dryers, but in some states it's more common. And there's about 123 million water heaters. And of course, there are other things that we have to electrify, which are not as much about the buildings themselves, although you need to have things like charging infrastructure, especially in multifamily units. This is a very big barrier to people moving to electric cars. For example, they don't have a place to charge it in their homes. Um, so we have to change the electricity, sorry, the, the vehicle fleet to electric uh, cars. And electric cars are actually really starting to take off. We're starting to see something like one in every four cars in some states being sold right now, being an electric car. Um, that should only consider continue with the new incentives uh, federally and also at the state level. And so that's a really big challenge, but it doesn't just have implications in terms of people buying the cars. It also affects charging infrastructure. It also affects the grid because when an electric vehicle plugs into a charging station, let's say in a building, it can have a very fast load. And so we may need, for example, smart meters or technology that can ramp up and down charging at cars so that you know if you put a charger in a building, it can dynamically take more power when more power is available and take less when less is available. I use, for example, in my own home, a, a piece of technology from a company called Span, which allows you to charge sort of dynamically. And then, of course, there are other really, really, really big machines that we have to change, namely 3,400 fossil fuel powered uh, plants uh, on the electricity system as well in this country. Now, when we think about these machines, it's important to think about their lifespan. How long do they last, right? Because if we remember that we're coming to the end of 2023 here, I can't believe it. I'm sure you can't either. And we have goals like 2030, you have to cut carbon pollution in half, you know, 2050, no more carbon pollution. Uh, those time periods are not as far in the future as you think, right? 2050 is 27 years from now. 2030 is like uh, closing in on six years from now. So these are not long times in the future. And so we have to think about, wow, if we have six years until we want to cut carbon pollution, every single time, for example, a water heater dies in a building, we really need it to be replaced by a heat pump hot water heater. Every time a furnace goes out, we really need it to be replaced by a heat pump, HVAC. Now, maybe in fact, we don't wanna wait until these machines die in the middle of the winter and we really need people to have heating. Maybe we wanna be proactive. And when these machines are starting to come to their useful life, actually transition them over. And if we miss these windows, it really starts to cut into our ability to meet our climate goals, right? You can start to see that because if a car lasts for 20 years and somebody buys a combustion engine car in let's say 2032, well, how is that gonna still allowed to be on the road by 2052 if we're supposed to not have carbon pollution by then? So we don't actually have a lot of room for error here in terms of how fast we have to be moving on these um, turnovers of machines. So the takeaway here of all of those numbers and all of those time periods is that there are 1 billion machines in the United States alone that run on fossil fuels. This is um, done by work uh, by Saul Griffith and others at Rewiring America. And we have no time left to waste in terms of making sure that every time a furnace dies, it's replaced, for example, by a heat pump. The good news is that heat pumps are really selling quite well. So for example, last year, they started to outsell gas furnaces pretty much for the first time in a very solid way. Um, and you know that is st that stock turnover is starting to happen. So here's, here's another way of looking at the data that I already showed you. In, in the case of, for example, furnaces, right? We're maybe like um, an eighth of the way to where we need to be nationwide. 
with water heaters, it's pretty bad, right? So heat pump hot water heaters are still technologies that are just beginning to be adopted. I have one in my house, but you know, these are newer technologies that aren't really being used yet. So water heaters, we have a long way to go. Cooking, it turns out that most gas stoves are actually concentrated in two democratic states, California and New York. So with all of the conversation about people taking away their gas stoves, turns out most people in this country are already cooking on electric. Um, and when it comes to cars, we are not where we need to be. So there's a lot, a lot of room to do on that. So what does this mean for Washington state in terms of how we think about this sort of what we would call stocks and flows, right? The turnover of machines and the pace that's necessary to actually hit the targets that we have. Well, right now, electric heat pumps in terms of the sales in the last few years are maybe like one in five in the state. And what we need to do is very quickly within this decade by 2030 transition or by 2035 transition until 100% of machines that are sold are electric heat pumps. And um, uh, sorry, and I, I misspoke. This is not the sales. This is the proportion in the system right now. Oh no, I, I misspoke again. It is the sales. <laughs> it is the sales. And then this is the proportion in the system. See, stocks and flows are very complicated, even if you have a PhD. So in terms of the stock, meaning the actual machines that are installed, if we start selling 100% heat pumps by 2035, you can see here, right, that we can hit that 2050 goal, but it's actually kind of tight. So this is why we're starting to have these amazing things happening, for example, in Washington State with the building code that are really nation leading because we need to have rules that are tilting all the machines towards electric as fast as possible. The last thing I wanna say about this is that the good news is that electric machines get cleaner every year. What, are, what do you mean? How can a machine get cleaner every year? Well, if you have a um, gas powered car, right? You drive, you fill it up, it burns as much uh, oil pretty much as it did from the first day. Maybe it gets a little bit less efficient over time, but it never gets cleaner. If you have an electric vehicle and at time one, you plug it into the electricity system and it's 17% dirty, 83% clean as it is right now in Washington state. And then Washington state gets to 90% clean and it's only 10% dirty. Well, your car just got cleaner. It actually is polluting less as you drive around. Well, let's plug it in and now it's 90%, 95% clean. So you can see because we're using electricity to power these machines, they actually get cleaner over time. That's some magic right there. That will never happen with a gas furnace. It will never happen with an oil powered car. This is why electric machines truly are magic. And it's also another rejoinder when people will tell you, well, how can you say a machine is clean? It's running on the electricity system. Well, actually all across this country, you put in a heat pump, you put in an electric vehicle, you run it on the electricity system, wherever it is in this country, it's already cleaner than burning oil in a car or burning gas in your furnace. So we already are at that baseline. And the good news is it gets even cleaner. And this is even the case, for example, in Hawaii, where they literally burn oil <laughs> from their electricity system. And this is because when you're burning something in a car or in your home, it's so inefficient. You lose about half of it, as I mentioned. Okay, so thank you for listening through that kind of 101 about clean electricity and electrification. I know I was going on for a while there, but I really hope that this will provide a framework for you to understand climate change and its solution. Because it's so easy to get lost in the kinds of messages that are put out by the climate community, by the media, by fossil fuel companies, right? you know, it can feel really muddy. And so hopefully this will give you a really clear roadmap. And it, it speaks very much to the question of affordable housing and what affordable housing can do about climate change, how it can benefit from climate policy um, and those kinds of things. So here's the thing. Buildings in Washington state are a pretty big chunk of the pollution. That's because the electricity system, as I've been talking about, is already so clean, right? So it's not a really big part of the pollution of the, the state. So buildings are a place where we can actually make really big progress. And in Washington state, as is the case really nationally, unfortunately, pollution from buildings has actually been increasing over time. So in the electricity sector, for example, Pollution has been coming down a lot because we've been putting more wind and solar and we've been getting rid of coal plants. But in buildings, they've actually been getting dirtier over time. 
just because we are building more and more of them, more people need them, we're burning fossil fuels in them. So it's not a sector where we're really starting to make progress. It is a sector where we will begin to make progress, but up till this moment, it's a place where we have a growth opportunity is what you could say. So Washington State, as you probably know, has a pretty amazing climate policy. It really is a leader in the country. Of course, um, Governor Inslee has worked on this uh, for a long time and we have really amazing laws on the books. So for example, by 2025, the state is planning to no longer use coal with that small slice of the electricity system that's still there. Um, there's also a goal for the electricity system to be um, greenhouse gas neutral by 2030 and to be truly 100% clean without any kind of need for offsets for something like a fossil gas plant by 2045. So this really is one of the leaders um, nationally. And there's also a number of policies in place on the building side that are really uh, best in class nationally. So the Clean for Building Performance Standard, you might have heard of this. This is basically a law that says for really big buildings, 50,000 square feet and higher, and now there's a second tier of 20,000 square feet and higher, that these buildings have to start making a plan for how they're going to reduce their carbon pollution. So just like we would say to an electric utility, hey, you need to have a plan for how you're going to reduce your carbon pollution. We're starting to see that for buildings too, for particularly very large buildings. This is very exciting. I think that Washington State um, is going to really set a standard across the country. And we can see performance standards, for example, at a county level and other places, at a city level, and of course, statewide. The state also has put in place an early adoption incentive program, which is a program that if you'd like to meet the building performance standard ahead of schedule, there's actually money on the table to help you do that. And of course, there's a a new standard that if you're going to build new um, buildings, you need to be using all electric heating and hot water. This is something that, for example, many cities across California have been doing. Also, the state of New York recently just passed last year. And so it says that, hey, we got to kind of stop the bleeding, right? If we're going to build a new building, let's build it clean. If we keep putting in fossil fuels, you know, we could have a furnace 30 years later, and that's not going to work with our climate goals. I now want to talk about some of the things that are happening at the federal level and how those could affect affordable housing in Washington state. People who have been following federal policy may know that there were efforts to get a lot more money for affordable housing in what was called Build Back Better. That got um, killed by uh, folks like Senator Manchin who didn't want to support that. That's been a really big um, loss, I would say. But it does mean that maybe if we have another opportunity to pass a bill, if the Democrats, for example, have the Senate and the House and the presidency uh, after next year, then we could see some more momentum around affordable housing funding and maybe even more money for uh, greening affordable housing. But we do still have the Green and Resilient Retrofit Program at HUD, the 45L, New Energy Efficient uh, Home Credit, and a bunch of programs that are going to be administered by the State Energy Office in Washington. So I want to just put this on your radar, the Green and Resilient Retrofit Program at HUD. This is the program that can help with affordable housing at various levels to basically kind of green the buildings. There is both an, there's an elements program, which is really trying to help uh, start out the, the basics of things like, you know, doing insulation or weatherization, starting to electrify, things like that. There's also a leading edge program, which is for buildings where they want to kind of get to a certification level, really try to be a best in class building. Those are higher funding levels. And then there's a comprehensive program where you can actually work with HUD and have support to get uh, through the process if you don't have as much uh, knowledge or experience in these areas. These programs have rolling deadlines. There's four deadlines. Um, one has already passed. Another one is coming up in the case of Elements. I think it's like next week, but there are still deadlines going into November or January into the new year. And there's quite a bit of money here for this. Off the top of my head, I wanna say it's like $812 um, million. And then there's additional $4 billion in loan uh, authority. So these, this is a big chunk of money. Anybody can be anybody in this world can be applying. And so, you know, Washington State could be ahead of the pack and really applying for some of this money. And there may be folks in the audience who are already applying for this, in which case, awesome. Love to hear it. And there's lots of resources on the HUD website. They have videos and ways that you can understand these programs in um, greater detail. There's also a tax credit called 45L, which is trying to um, create additional 
resources to be building uh, new affordable housing through tax credits. So this program is requiring new multifamily buildings uh, affordable housing to meet Energy Star requirements, as well as a new DOE zero energy ready, ready home program. And they actually just updated the guidance on what that looks like. So you can go on their website and, and read about that. The tax credit is $5,000 per dwelling unit uh, if the project meets prevailing wage requirements. It's much lower if the project does not. But the idea is that there is incentive. So if you want to do the right thing, you're trying to build buildings that are electrification ready for uh, heat pumps or heat pump hot water heaters that have, you know, a really good insulation uh, metric that you're trying to do the right thing. And it costs a little bit more money to do that. There is money available through this tax credit to help make those numbers pencil out. And I also want to flag these um, rebate programs that are going to start flowing through the state energy office. So Washington State is going to receive $166 million. This part of the funding is through formula. So the other things that I was talking about, the tax credits and that money through HUD, that's not through formula. So if you apply for the tax credit or if you apply for that funding, it doesn't matter where in the country you're from. There's not like a single amount of money just for Washington State. But these programs are done through formula, which means that Washington State will receive $166 million to support building electrification and efficiency. And uh, there's a chunk of money, about half that money for electrification rebates. Um, this is a program that has two tiers, one of which is for 150% of area median income and below, and another is for 80% of area median income below and below. You can get up to $14,000 for that 80% and below to help with things like hot water um, heat pumps, uh, a heat pump HVAC, induction stoves, wiring upgrades, panel upgrades, things like that. Um, oh, and I didn't mention this. There's also just the 25C tax credit, which can also help with things like um, brick or box upgrades. And there's also another uh, a chunk of money for the efficiency rate, rate program. This is a program that involves either modeled or measured energy savings and a building level. So you have a building, you'd like to retrofit it, you want to... Um, uh, reduce how much energy it uses. And uh, you can apply to this program through uh, the Washington State Energy Office to receive that. And they'll develop the program and they'll have a whole way to do it. The cool thing about this program is that 40% of the money is for low income and there's a specific 10% set aside for multifamily low income. However, as we were talking about for the talk, these are only minimums. Meaning that Washington state could choose to set aside more of this $83 million for, for example, multifamily affordable housing. They could say that that's a really big priority to have more of the dollars flow in that way. I personally think that that should happen because what we've seen with other incentive programs for heat pumps, for example, or electric vehicles in other states like California is that they often go to wealthier people. And you know, it's great to have an EV on the road or a heat pump in the house, but it's really important that we make progress on electrifying affordable housing and low income housing. That's a high, high priority. And the dollars to make that pencil out aren't as easy. And so I personally believe that all of this money should be going towards low income and multifamily. So I just want to give you a sense of what on earth are these programs? How do they work? So the efficiency rebates are a modeled energy savings program or a measured energy savings program, as I mentioned. And they basically say, um, depending on the income level of folks uh, living in this building and depending on how much energy is saved, you can get um, $4,000, for example, per dwelling unit. And so, you know, you can start to see that through these different programs, you can start to get significant funding to actually retrofit existing programs to build new, uh, sorry, retrofit existing buildings, build new buildings and do it with efficiency and electrification in mind. The measured energy savings program, which means you actually look to see if you saved the energy that you said you would or not, um, is a little bit more generous. Um, I want to start to close by just pointing out some other interesting things that are happening in other parts of the country. So people might be familiar with WE Act. It's an environmental justice organization in New York State. Um, they are based largely in the Bronx. And they did a pilot in affordable housing in the Bronx where they gave 
um, people living in units, uh, induction stoves, and they are monitoring what does that do to the air quality? Do people actually like to cook with them or not? And they have found, and you can watch, there's a video about this online, it's really cool, um, that people love the induction stoves in, in the affordable housing units, that it does really improve air quality, that it reduces asthma, for example, which we know can be so common um, in these communities. And so that it's a really, it was a really exciting and successful pilot program. There is also, for example, in Oakland, California, the healthcare system is doing a pilot program similarly where they are prescribing, for example, an induction stove as an asthma treatment because people who are cooking with um, these uh, stoves are really, you know, exposing themselves. And if you're curious about this, you don't have to read scientific papers. You can just buy a little air quality monitor. I have one in my home. It's called IQ Air. And you can see the particulate matter in your home when you cook. Uh, it's quite an enlightening experience. So I hope this was an interesting talk. I just want to close by saying that, um, you know, all of you are doing such important work. I'm sure that many days it's not easy, but just really big gratitude to all of you for the work that you're doing. And that I hope that the affordable housing community will be an amazing partner as we move towards electrification. And personally, if we get the chance to try to pass another federal bill, I am planning to work very hard to get more money for affordable housing electrification, as well as school electrification, which is not something I talked about today. So just really big gratitude to all of you. And uh, I think we're going to do some Q&A now. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stokes. It feels like you condensed the last six and a half years of my life into about 30 minutes. So I appreciate that reflection. And um, also want to extend my appreciation for the folks who were brave enough to uh, put questions into various chat uh, elements that we've got here. I'm going to ask folks to um, think about the question that they uh, want to ask, but weren't quite brave enough to put in there. Uh, we have a few minutes to get those questions answered. But the folks that did put something forward kind of falls into two categories. One is around kind of costs and deployment of new technology. Um, and um, the other one is about kind of specifically deploying uh, new technology into uh, low income households. And so I'll, I'll start with that one and then maybe talk a little bit about costs and see what else uh, comes up. There's also a, an engineering question in there, uh, which may require some follow up. But um, you touched on this um, a little bit at the end when you brought in elements of health in addition to the energy and climate concerns that you uh, spent the most of your time talking about. Um, how, how do you think about um, risks deploying new technology into the homes of low-income folks? Um, for my time in the weatherization program, I remember talking about this when we were deploying uh, fans to improve ventilation for some of the issues you talked about with cooking. There was concerns that folks might not be able to maintain it. Um, you know, if it breaks and doesn't work, um, that might be a problem. But stepping back from that specific example, uh, how do you think about those risks and trade-offs? Yeah, well, those are great questions, and I'm sure it's top of mind. You know, we don't want to saddle low-income communities with broken technology with things that don't work. The good news is that heat pumps are actually a technology that's been around for a long time. Um, they're pretty well used. Um, so I do think that people will have a good experience with them. There are some challenges, particularly around humidity, for example. They need to be installed correctly. This is particularly important for uh, heat pump hot water heaters. And so, you know, it is going to be important that as these um, these things happen, that they're done not just from an operations perspective well, but also from an installation perspective. And I want to point folks to uh, Efficiency Maine, which is an amazing, they're like the State Energy Office of Maine, and they are installing like 30% of all the heat pumps in this country in Maine right now, which is like, what, what is happening there? We've been interviewing a lot of the program officers in their uh, program. And, you know, what they find is that um, it's really important to make sure that there's a training installation program so that people who are going out to do the installing have to go through training, that there is quality assurances, that if there are concerns raised, there are ways to follow up with people. So it's really important that um, we get that right and that we that we build workforce training and development into these programs. And Efficiency Maine has really done an amazing job of that. Um, 
I think too, you know, yes, there can be maybe downsides to giving people new technologies, but I think that's why the We Act example with the induction stoves is so powerful. And I would really encourage people to watch those videos. You know, um, they were giving uh, people from many different backgrounds, immigrant communities, for example, induction stoves, and they did teach them how to use the induction stove and make sure they have good cookware, for example, to go along with it, because you need things that can basically uh, cook with magnets. Um, it has to be some kind of iron in it, right? Uh, so they were all happy with it. Every single person who was in the program wanted to keep their stove. They were given an option to get rid of it at the end of the day. Everybody liked them. And in the control group, because they did a control and treated group, they also offered people to get the induction stove. So I think we also have to remember there's a cost to not giving new technology to lower income communities. And the cost can be things like asthma, for example, if we have fossil fuels burning indoors. It can be more expensive energy bills because as more and more people exit the energy system, right? For example, the gas system, the, the gas costs are likely to go up. And it's really important that we're not leaving lower income communities stranded with very expensive gas systems. And so I personally feel that, you know, I want lower income communities and affordable housing uh, buildings to be almost first in a certain sense, not in the sense of being a guinea pig with technology that's going to break, but in the sense of making sure that, you know, people who wouldn't be able to pay for it otherwise actually have resources from the state to do it versus having wealthier people who can afford to do it, doing it more on their own dime. Thanks for that. Um, I think what you laid out there makes a lot of sense. Um, and it echoes uh, conversations that we have here in the Washington State Energy Office and uh, with the partners that we have in state government and beyond. Um, one other question to put forward is around costs. And so one of the questions asks, um, you know, uh, well, you've laid out some of the codes and standards, right? So there'll be requirements to electrify going forward. Um, and you've laid out uh, federal and state funding through incentives uh, and other kind of direct programs to bring down costs. Uh, but a, a classic question is, will this increase costs for construction? Um, you know, um, there are not unlimited federal resources. So how do we think about that in a state which, uh, like, like I think every other state has an affordable housing crisis? Um, and then it, maybe the, the third question related to this is, what if electricity costs go up? Um, you know, some concerns about vulnerable households being able to, to make ends meet with their utility bills. Uh, so how do you think about costs in some of those dimensions? Yeah, so... One thing I briefly showed, which maybe uh, was very fast, was the stock turnover. The fact is there's actually a lot of people in electric resistance right now. And that's a winner when it comes to energy bills. The way you save energy bills guaranteed is by switching somebody off of delivered fuels pretty much, because that's very expensive if you're using oil or propane, for example, or switching them from electric resistance to a heat pump. Because like I mentioned, electric resistance is using electricity already, just more of it. So it's pretty much by definition, you're going to save money. So there are a lot of entry points where we can guaranteed save money. And then in terms of gas versus electricity prices, it depends on the state. I did not pull up, although we have the data, <laughs> if it's a winner or not in Washington, maybe Michael knows off the top of his head. But the important thing to remember is that Yes, electricity bills could go up, but gas bills are almost certainly going to go up. We are starting to see, for example, rate increases in California with SoCal Gas, my my former gas utility, because I don't use gas anymore, that are just nuts. I mean, I'm talking like 15, 18% increases, like very, very large increases. And so, yes, electricity bills could go up, but so, of course, can gas bills. And so that really is the question that we have to have. In terms of the costs of new construction, and is it more expensive to build affordable housing this way. Um, there, there have been a few studies on this that suggest that building all electric from the start is the same cost or potentially cheaper. And it does make sense because if you're building a new building, you and you have to build both gas, you have to label gas pipes as well as electricity, that actually is two systems. It can actually be more expensive. So in general, if it's a new building, there's a view that it can be cheaper. Retrofits are a different story. And that's where we're probably going to need dollars from, for example, the state and federal government to do more. Um, but I would just remind folks that you know, if we build a new building with gas, even if it is cheaper, I don't believe it is, but let's say it is, and then you have to retrofit it before those machines reach their end of their useful life, that's not actually cheaper. Or you start to see mounting gas prices and, you know, the, the operating costs of that building go up. That's not cheaper either. So hopefully if we build efficient, you know, well-insulated um, buildings from the start, they can start to pay dividends in terms of having lower operating costs. Great. 
Um, thanks for that. I want to stay with the idea of existing buildings. There's a question there about that, but I want to uh, share some appreciation for the folks who have dialed up their bravery to ask questions. Um, and so um, how do you think about the challenge that states like Washington and, and other states across the country have when it comes to retrofitting existing building stock? We have this standard that you mentioned, um, which I believe is the first state in the country to, uh, to have a, a clean building incentive for existing buildings. We've just gone through um, um, a reduction in size to make more build, buildings eligible. Yeah, um, yeah. And that, that's pretty unique. But um, what are the tools that you think folks should think about um, when they approach the challenge of um, uh, decarbonizing existing buildings? Yeah. So, you know, there is that kind of carrot and stick thing that we're talking about here, right? There's sort of a push on the side of the building standard and then a carrot on the other side, whether those are state programs like the early adopter program or the early incentive program I talked about, or, you know, the um, the federal programs that I mentioned as well. You know, so there is a way that we're both requiring people to do it and hopefully making it easier. And I think if affordable housing um, you know, folks are realizing that there isn't enough money, we should, that should be raised up within the climate community and put forward as a priority, right? Like the goal here is not to give an impossible mandate to affordable housing to electrify. The goal is to help everybody across society make the transition to cleaner machines, to hopefully less expensive machines, to better machines, and not leave communities behind. And so there are incentives at the level that they are today. And I've laid a bunch of them out and I hope that was helpful for folks. But if we find that this is not enough, well, then we need to go find more money because, you know, as a community, and I already know that the climate community is starting to have these conversations around how do we make sure that we get more money for affordable housing and sort of green affordable housing going forward. Um, so there's the money that we have today and it may be that we need even more money. Yeah, that notion of, of the, the true costs that will uh, be needed to uh, achieve the transition is very real. Um, in my conversations with folks at the federal administration, uh, they're, I think they've acknowledged that this is a down payment, but it is not um, sufficient to get all of the folks and all the communities and all the infrastructure and industries in our uh, in our in our nation where uh, we need to be to meet the uh, the bold goals that the Biden administration has. Uh, so I feel fortunate to be working here in Washington State, where you know we're continuing to uh, to put funding where we know it will make a difference in people's lives. Uh, so I just want to thank you, um, Dr. Stokes, um, and then pivot to the folks who have uh, asked questions that I don't think we're going to have a chance to answer, uh, and then I will wrap up. Um, so the the first idea is there's some interesting questions about what about middle income families and others that are struggling, um, yes. and and it's a great great question. And um, you mentioned Dr. Stokes, we're on this pathway to design the pro the, these federal programs, and we have state funding. Um, and so I look forward to continuing the dialogue with the Housing Finance Commission and other partners so we make sure we can take into account the needs of the state and design a program that will work for our most vulnerable folks uh, and for the state as a whole. So um, I see that Kate DeCramer is on the call. She's been a, a thought partner as we think about federal funds. And so um, we'll do more of that. There's a question about uh, hydroelectricity. And um, it, yes, it might not be an emitting source, but there are complications when it comes to um, natural resources, other uses, tribal rights. And what I would say there is that the uh, there have been a number of studies that have looked at um, what to do about dams. Uh, there's mm -hmm. currently uh, funding for uh, my office to work with um, a contractor to look at the lower Snake River dams and what it would take from an energy perspective uh, to replace those dams. And there's a similar study at the Washington State Department of Transportation looking at the transportation impacts. So we are looking at that um, and it's a big question. Um, and so I appreciate the, the comment there. It's a question about um, uh, low temp heat pumps and you know concerns at a certain level and there are parts of Washington State that get really cold. Um, I spent a lot of time chatting with friends in uh, in Maine, the State Energy Office Director there and being jealous yes. about the installed numbers that they have. But I also spent a lot of time talking with Minnesota and kind of their approach to dealing with low temp heat pumps. I'm gonna put my um, email in the chat in case anybody wants to follow up with technical energy nerd questions from Washington perspective, please reach out, let's chat. Um, and the last question was one around um, the engineering question around uh, energy loss. 
And so uh, Adrian, happy to, happy to talk with you about transmission losses, battery storage issues, and uh, hydrogen as, a, as an energy carrier, uh, if you would like to. Um, let's see, I, I can't quite speak to other sessions that are uh, at the, um, at the in-person conference, but I know that there's gonna be a whole team of folks, uh, my colleagues from the housing portion of the Department of Commerce, and they know how to find me if uh, your questions don't get answered here or there. With that, I'm going to say that um, it's been a pleasure um, learning and listening today. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Stokes, for what you've done at the national level and for bringing that perspective here to Washington State. Um, it'll enrich the conversations we have as we build these programs out. And for folks that are um, uh, are not yet aware, there will be one uh, additional lunchtime meeting next week uh, with Chris Herbert from the Joint Center for Housing Studies. Uh, that's on uh, this same bat time, same bat channel on uh, 928, so next Thursday. Have a great day. Uh, thanks so much. I look forward to seeing you in person one day soon, Dr. Stokes. Thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.